friends, this moment is not only a professional thrill, to welcome tonight's honored guest is a personal joy. Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson, president of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and its IH and Anna Grancell Professor of Jewish Religious Thought, is internationally recognized for his publications and research in the areas of theology and philosophy, ethics, and modern Jewish history. He received his PhD from Columbia University in 1981 and was ordained by HUCJIR in 1977. He's a fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and a fellow and lecturer at the Institute of Advanced Studies at Hebrew University. Rabbi Ellenson's extensive publications include Tradition and Transition, Orthodoxy, Halaha, and the Boundaries of Modern Jewish History, Rabbi Ezreal Heldesheimer and the Creation of a Modern Jewish Orthodoxy, nominated for the National Jewish Book Council's Award for Outstanding Book in Jewish History, Between Tradition and Culture, the Dialectics of Jewish Religion and the Identity in the Modern World, After Emancipation, Jewish Religious Responses to Modernity, which won the National Jewish Book Council's Award as the Outstanding Book in Jewish Thought, and Pledges of Jewish Allegiance, Conversion, Law, and Policymaking in 19th and 20th Century Orthodoxy, Orthodox Responsa, co-authored with Daniel Gordas. That is what his official biography will tell you. But what those of us who were blessed to be students in his classroom in Los Angeles will tell you is that Dr. David Ellenson is simply an extraordinary human being, rabbi, and visionary whose ability to articulate a Jewish response to the challenges of modernity is grounded in the profoundest aspirations of our prophetic heritage, the highest scholarship, and most of all, the deepest love for our people. To sit and listen to him speak of Abraham Joshua Heschel is to glimpse Heschel's view of what the world might yet be, and to watch him weep when speaking of the beloved Leo Beck's ministering to the inmates of Theresen, from which Beck himself could have escaped, is to understand what it means to love the Jewish people. David is a very special force in my life and in the Jewish world, and he will continue to be that even after his retirement as HUC's president at the end of December. As you know, tonight's program is the first in a year-long series on the history and future of Reformed Judaism, so timely at this moment of transition in the life of our temple. As I said on Friday night, we have a proud legacy of leadership to uphold as one of our movement's flagship congregations, and that demands we understand where we have come from and where we might be headed. Shortly after my arrival in July, David came by the temple to help me think through the important topics we would need to discuss. While he was here, I asked him if he wouldn't mind starting us off, and he said what he always says, yes. He'd be happy to. And he's going to return to us for a second evening in April as well. Between now and then, the conversation will continue. Next Thursday at 6 o'clock, Rabbi Dr. Gary Zola, Hebrew Union College Professor of the American Jewish Experience and Executive Director of the American Jewish Archives, will speak about the beginnings of American Reform Judaism in Charleston, South Carolina. Then in the spring, we will discuss our movement's commitments to Israel and social justice and the evolution of our theology, our liturgy, and our music. And in May, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, president of the Union for Reform Judaism, and Dr. Aaron Pankin, president-elect of the College Institute, will consider the future of Reform Judaism in a new and changing world. My great gratitude to our committee, chaired by Dr. Claudia Platel and guided, too, by Dr. Mark Weistock and our librarian, Liza Stabler, for their extraordinary efforts organizing these great programs, which begin tonight, as Dr. Ellenson will lead us in a look back to the 19th century at two divergent approaches to Jewish religious reform and what we might learn from them for the challenges of our own time. 
His talk will be titled, Two Types of 19th Century American Reform Judaism, Isaac Mayer Wise, David Einhorn, and their significance for Reform Judaism today. But I am not the only rabbi in the room who would pay loving tribute to David tonight. I want to invite our beloved Rabbi Emeritus, Dr. David Posner, to the microphone to say a few words as well. And then Rabbi David Ellens. Dear friends, good evening to you all. Thanks for coming and a special thanks to our senior rabbi, Josh, for giving us a lecture series which is both timely and eternal. I've had the COVID, the honor of introducing Rabbi David Ellenson for a, for, for, uh, introducing him a few times. And I've always enjoyed, uh, enjoyed creating, creating a variation on the themes of David's remarkable abilities and talents. Just to begin with some history, David Ellenson was ordained at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in 1977 here on the New York campus. Keep in mind that the New York campus of HUC is actually the territory of none other than one Sylvia Posner, known in the Jewish world as Sippy, David's mentor and dissertation advisor at that time was the late Professor Fritz Bamberger, who was a member of Temple Emanuel and who was the advisor of the president of Hebrew Union College one of his, the provisor, the provisor to the president of Hebrew Union College's late Alfred Gottschalk of blessed memory. These are people known to you by many. It was at that time that Fritz told me, Fritz told me and Sill about a Hebrew Union College student by the name of David Ellenson. Not only did Fritz tell me that David was a brilliant student, he also told me that this student was going to do something most interesting and daring. He was pursuing his studies at HUC full time while simultaneously being enrolled at the Graduate School of Columbia University taking a PhD in Jewish history. This meant, of course, that there had to have been conflicts in schedule time, and I figured out that David must have been a very crafty student, knowing the ins and outs quite literally. This really piqued my interest because in one of my years at HUC, I too managed to sign up for two classes simultaneously in order to make sure that I would be ordained way ahead of the game. I sugar-talked the registrar, even though I didn't have David Ellenson's Southern charm. The two professors knew nothing of this, and David, the professors were Mike Meyer and Stanley Chayat, Zichrono Livracha. I'm confessing this now for the first time in my life. <laughs> Only Syl knew. So, dear friends, let me tell you a bit more about David Ellenson. He has a range of scholarship in general and Jewish scholarship in particular that harken back to the era of the HUC presidency of Rabbi Dr. Kaufman Kohler, the same Kaufman Kohler who was the rabbi of Temple Emanuel here on Fifth Avenue and which emerged with Emanuel in 1925. 
David Ellenson is Wissenschaftlicher in and out and through and through. I would say that he has a range of scholarship, a breadth of intellect, and an innate talent for leadership not known by any other Jewish leader at our time. That is why we chose to give him the inaugural lecture of the Charles Grossman lecture here only a few years ago. David is a very rare, special combination. He has a remarkable ability to combine his Virginian Southern charm with Hjekkakite, that is German Jewish Wissenschaft, scientific application with homespun schmooze. It doesn't come any better than that. Dear David, thank you for being here. And dear Dash, dear Dash, thank you for having let me introduce. Thank you. Erev Tov, good evening. Uh, I think to say thank you to Rabbi Davidson and Rabbi Posner is something of an understatement. I very much appreciate uh, your words. I'm particularly appreciative that with Rabbi Posner, often when I'm introduced, people will occasionally say one of the greatest in whatever the noun is that follows, but I'm very appreciative, uh, Rabbi Posner, that you didn't qualify it in any way uh, and made it simply the superlative. Uh, but it is really a great, great pleasure to be here. I welcome all of you here this evening, and I look forward to beginning what I know, as Rabbi Davidson said, will be a year-long discussion here at the temple of directions that Reform Judaism has taken where we are now and ultimately where it is that our movement may well move in the future. Uh, tonight I want to go back to the 19th century. It is frankly my favorite century, whether in America or in Germany. Uh, most of my studies, not all, most of them, or a great many, do focus on the 19th century. And what I would like to do tonight would be to talk about two major figures. Uh, Isaac Mayer Wise, who is known popularly as the founder of the Reform Movement. He was the founder of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, today the Union for Reform Judaism, the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati in 1875, and the Central Conference of American Rabbis, our rabbinic organization, in 1889. Rabbi Wise lived from 1819 to 1900. And I want to contrast him tonight with Rabbi David Einhorn. Einhorn lived from 1807 to 1879. Uh, and he and Rabbi Wise, and this again is always unusual, and if you did not attend this lecture tonight, you might not have been aware of this, there are moments where Jews disagree with one another. Uh, in fact, Jews do not always agree with each other. And Rabbi Wise and Rabbi Einhorn disagreed on more than one occasion. I want to try to outline for you the broad strokes of how it is that each of these men approach Judaism, their interactions, the directions they took, and then try to talk about why the view of one of these men, Rabbi Einhorn, actually came to dominate Reform Judaism at the end of the 19th century. And in fact, throughout most of the 20th century, the type of Reform Judaism that dominated was not the Reform Judaism that Isaac Mayer Wise the founder of all the institutions of Reform Judaism had envisioned, but rather it was the Reform Judaism of David Einhorn that dominated. And then I want to say why it is today that we may be living in an era when the vision of Rabbi Wise will come to dominate and not that of Rabbi Einhorn. With that said, let me move directly into these two, two great figures. As I said, Wise 
born in Germany, South Central Germany, came to the United States at the age of 27. He began to serve as a rabbi in Albany, New York. Now, this is a little difficult for me to fully, fully confess, but I do want to say the following about Rabbi Wise. Rabbi Wise, of course, established the Hebrew Union College, the authority of Rabbi Posner, Rabbi Davidson, all of your rabbis here, my authority stems directly from Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise. But when the question comes, who in fact gave rabbinical ordination to Rabbi Wise, as it were, it would be the type of thing if you were to say to him, so who ordained you as a rabbi? He would say something akin to, it looks like the weather is beginning to change here in New York tonight, and it may be that there will be rain. I say that because it is absolutely unclear as to whether he actually ever received semicha, whether he actually ever received rabbinic ordination. But you know what I say? He looked like a rabbi, he talked like a rabbi, he acted like a rabbi, I call him rabbi. But the reality is, and this will become a point later, when Wise and Einhorn argued with one another, um, Einhorn would often refer to him, and now I am just quoting, and I am not commenting in any way on the cantorant and its dignity, but often in polemics in which these men would engage. Rabbi Einhorn would say of Rabbi Wise as the, in quotes, little chazan from Cincinnati observed. By the way, in turn, Rabbi Wise would often say things like, as my esteemed colleague, the Reverend Einhorn observed. Uh, that will already begin to give you a sense of the different positions each of these men took. Wise came initially to Albany, New York. In that community, he gained a reputation right away as a reform rabbi. Why? Because in a public setting, when asked the question, do you believe in the coming of a personal Messiah? He said no, he did not believe in the coming of a personal Messiah, but rather he believed in a messianic age. As a result, he was condemned by many people in the community, by the way, quite correctly, from the point of view of Jewish dogma and belief, as not being, in quotes, an orthodox or traditional Jew. But he also established other rules. And I don't know, Rabbi Davidson, if you want to establish this rule here in your congregation. He believed also that no one could serve on the board of the synagogue who was not a Sabbath observer. If a person had their business open on Shabbat, he did not believe that such a person could exercise legitimate Jewish authority, that their authenticity as a Jewish leader had to be questioned. I say this to you because part of what you need to understand with Wise and the episode that I'm about to describe is also illustrative of some of the dimensions of Judaism in the modern world. Often, for many Jews in the modern world, living in an age in which secularism comes to dominate, meaning here not that religion disappears, but that religion, from the standpoint of secularization, means that religion does not inform each and every attitude that an individual would take, Judaism often becomes localized within the synagogue. That is to say, people will define themselves often as reform conservative orthodox, not on the basis necessarily of how they practice Judaism, but on the basis of the synagogue to which they belong. Judaism and the identity of Jews often, often will be associated with the synagogue to which they belong and not the way in which they practice Judaism. So, for example, if you were to speak to most conservative Jews, I doubt they would tell you, yes, I observe Judaism according to the teachings of Rabbi Zachariah Frankel, who lived from 1801 to 1875 and was an exponent of what's called positive historical Judaism. And it is through his teachings that I 
decide how it is I'm going to observe Jewish religion and practice, I suspect if you were to say Zacharias Frankel to most people who belong to conservative congregations, they might say something like, I don't know, Zeke Frankel, wasn't he a shortstop for the Cubs in whatever the year was? In other words, the point I want to make is, particularly from the viewpoint of folk Judaism and how most Jews observe Jewish religious tradition, the way in which they define themselves may not be in accord with how elite religious leaders would define what Jewish observance ought to be and what the appropriate beliefs are that people ought to have that would motivate observance. The key point here in Albany is that I want you to see an irony that I'm about to describe. On the one hand, many of his congregants and many of the people in Albany condemned Wise as a reformer, but at the same time, they were, and we know from letters and other documents, quite upset that in terms of religious praxis, he had a standard that was far beyond what most of the people in his congregation were actually observing. This all came to a head on Rosh Hashanah in 1850. Rabbi Wise was about to take the Torah out of the ark. How many of you know the story I'm about to tell? Well, one or two of you, and what's fortunate is I do know the story, and that's why I'm the lecturer tonight. <laughs> he was about to take the Torah out of the ark, and often when you think about what it is that happens, let's say on Rosh Hashanah, people get together from different congregations, different families, they come together and they go, well, what did the rabbi talk about today at your service? We have someone in our family, my wife is here, where He'll often say, the rabbi talked about, and then whatever the amount of time is, he'll say 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes too long. But uh, I won't say who the source of that uh, observation is. But here they really had something to talk about in Albany that day. Because as Rabbi Wise went to take the Torah from the ark, his opponents ran up on the bima and tried to wrest the Torah from him. His supporters then came up, started to fight with the people who were opposed to Rabbi Wise, and before you knew it, there was a great Donnybrook. It is one of the most memorable events, famous or infamous, however one would like to look at it, in American Jewish history. As a result, Rabbi Wise left his pulpit and became the rabbi of a congregation that still exists in Albany today, Beth Emmett. Shortly thereafter, he left Albany, New York, and he went to Cincinnati, Ohio. Now you may ask, why did he come to Cincinnati, Ohio? In 1860 through 1870, at a time when there were approximately well, by 1870, 1880, you had about 250, 225,000 Jews in North America. 225,000 Jews came between 1815 and 1881. They were all virtually from Central Europe and they were all German speaking. This will be an important point that I'm going to get back to. It was a culturally homogeneous American Jewish community, known popularly as the period of German Jewish domination. Virtually all of these Jews were part of a German culture, a German society, and they had come to America seeking economic improvement and political freedom. People always immigrate or emigrate because by and large something's wrong with where they are and they desire life to be better regardless of the particular reason in the country to which they come. In 1860, New York City had approximately 30,000 Jews. Cincinnati, Ohio in that same period had approximately 30,000 Jews. Cincinnati in the 1860s and 70s was to the Midwest what Chicago became. The Queen City, the Ohio River was the way to the West. With the coming of the railroad, Chicago supplanted Cincinnati as the center 
of commercial life in the Midwest. But I say this because if you ask ultimately why the Hebrew Union College had a branch in Cincinnati, it is because Rabbi Wise went there because it was a city culturally from a Jewish perspective that was the equal of New York City during that period. <laughs> We just finished a board meeting. I see that we have several of our board members here. I'll just make an observation that I did not make in Cincinnati, but it is true. Today, Cincinnati, Ohio still boasts of 30,000 Jews, and New York City boasts of more Jews than Cincinnati, Ohio today, give or take 1.7 million. New York community has somewhat outstripped Cincinnati in the last 150 years. Leaving that aside, he comes to Cincinnati and he surely makes a decision at that point that by and large there are no national Jewish organizations. Keep in mind there is no federation, there is no rabbinical council of America, there is no union of orthodox Jewish congregations, no united synagogue of conservative Judaism, no reconstructionist rabbinical college, no union for reform Judaism. America in many ways is a tabula rasa. Wise comes into this situation and he quickly makes the decision, and I do want to emphasize the following. Wise may not have been ordained as a rabbi, but he was certainly very, very learned. Wise is working as a rabbi in this milieu, and he comes to a conclusion. If America does not produce rabbinic leadership, the American Jewish community will never reach its potential. The vision that Isaac Mayer Wise had was that without appropriate leadership, without vision, the people will perish. You have to have appropriate leadership if the Jewish community was going to thrive. As a result, he wanted to create a rabbinical school, and in 1854, he proposed a rabbinical college, the Zion Collegiate Institute. Now let me ask you, and now I'll speak in part in light of my experience as president of the college since 2001. If you are going to create a college, what is it you need? Not a trick question. What do you have to have? <laughs> Students. Good. What else do you need? What? Faculty. faculty. Students. Faculty. What else? Money, good, I'm glad you got to that. You need students, you need faculty, you want a library, you want buildings. My students want scholarships. <laughs> the professors want to be paid. The lights need to be turned on, you have to have money. He had no money. The college failed completely. One of the things that I admire about Isaac Mayer Wise is not that he succeeded each and every time. What I admire about Wise is that even when he failed, he learned from his mistakes. He could not create a rabbinical college in the 1850s, but it did not deter him in his aspiration to create a rabbinical school that he thought was crucial, the sine qua non, for the flourishing of Judaism in North America. As a result, he did several things. First, in 1855, if you look at your documents, he created a synod. He brought all the rabbis in North America together. He wanted to unite them in what was called the Cleveland Conference of 1855. How many rabbis do you think he brought to this conference? Okay, again, I know the answer. His seven people came. Prior, by the way, to 1840, there were no ordained rabbis in North America, not one. If you're ever on Jewish Jeopardy, and the name Abraham Rice comes up, R-I-C-E, you can say, who was the first ordained rabbi to come? to North America. There were no ordained rabbis in North America prior to 1840. Abraham Rice of Baltimore was the first one. And now I speak strictly objectively. 
There was never such a horrible period in the history of the Jewish people from the time of the destruction of the temple until 1840. Without rabbis, the community cannot flourish. And I say that objectively, but I would add from another perspective, I don't know, the community survived from 1654 to 1840. It did okay, but never as well as when you had ordained rabbis. He brings these seven rabbis together, and if you look at the document, you'll note that he says, the Bible as delivered to us by our fathers and is now in our possession is of immediate divine origin and the standard of our religion. The Talmud contains a traditional legal and logical exposition of the biblical laws, which must be expounded and practiced according to the comments of the Talmud. Does this sound like the viewpoint of a reform rabbi? Good, it does not. Isaac Merwise signed this document. One of the great things I would say about Isaac Merwise, you've all heard the line from, uh, I think it was Emerson. I think it was Emerson, not Thoreau, who said that foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. One of the points I want to make is that Isaac Merwise, if that is true, when you take out the word foolish, let's just say consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Isaac Merwise had one of the greatest minds there ever was. He signed this platform. We're going to see in a moment. He signed another platform that said, we need pay no attention to the Talmud whatsoever. There are positions, we have papers, where at times he said, of course I observe kashrut. And at other times, of course, he said, I don't know, can you pass the oysters and the shrimp? Uh, he was not overwhelmingly ideological, let me put it that way. He was, he brought flexibility to a new level, is another way to put it. He also created a prayer book, and I was sorry that I couldn't really get a copy that I could bring out of the library. His prayer book was called the Minhag America. What does the word Minhag mean? Custom. Custom. And America, all of you know America, the American custom. What's interesting about this prayer book is it reveals the ideology of the man who wrote it. On the one hand, by using a term minhag, he wanted to indicate that he was following in Jewish tradition. There is minhag Sfarah, the Sephardic custom, minhag Ashkenaz, the Ashkenazic custom, Minhag Teman, the Yemenite custom, uh, Minhag Polin, the Polish custom. Wise wanted to signal in the very title of his book that he intended his prayer book to be traditional in the way that prayer books throughout history, Jewish history had been. And on the other hand, he called it the Minhag America because he wanted to assert that in America, Judaism could be recast in ways that were comparable to the ways in which Jews in other times and places had recast their tradition. The Minhag America is an old new prayer book. I call it an old new prayer book because on the one hand it retains the structure and the feel. He wrote it in three editions of a traditional prayer book. It opened Hebrew on one side, English on the other, Hebrew on one side, German on the other, and one of his prayer books, one of the editions, was completely written in Hebrew. If you were not a person who was learned in Judaism, the prayer book looks, in quotes, it has the feel of a traditional, one would say, orthodox or conservative prayer book. The frontispiece contains laws from the Talmud and Shulchan Aruch written in Hebrew, untranslated. If I were to bring this prayer book into Temple Emmanuel, no one would identify it as a Reformed prayer book. But the Hebrew there says words like, Yehol Adam lehit paleo b'chol ha'shon A person can pray in any language they desire. He used traditional warrants to justify what were going to be significant changes. Also, in one edition of his prayer book, for the first time, to my knowledge, in Jewish history, he says 10 adults, male or female, to be counted in a minion. 
That is the first time I am aware of in Jewish history that this was ever done in a formal way. From an Orthodox standpoint, there are all sorts of changes that he made. In the Avot prayer, or Avos, as you would say it here at Emmanuel, using the Ashkenazic accent, he changes, for example, where it says, Praise to you, O Lord, our God and God of our ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Zoher Chastei Avot, that God remembers the loving deeds of our ancestors. He changed it to the Zoher Brit Avot. God, he felt, did not remember the loving deeds of your ancestors. You were not going to get Zachut, privilege or credit, because of what your fathers or mothers did. Rather, each Jew has to stand in covenantal tradition and is responsible today to answer the demands that God would place upon us in our world. The key point is, when you look at a prayer book, there is the manifest content, what the words say. But in any service, there's an emotive content. What's the music? Do people wear kippot? Do they wear talesim? There are all sorts of other clues from the standpoint of semiotics, of symbols and signs that may have more to do with your prayer experience than the actual words themselves. What is interesting is that Wise's prayer book, from the standpoint of emotive content, felt like a traditional prayer book. It opened as a Hebrew book would open, and there were pages of Hebrew, and then pages of English or German. Wise created a prayer book that indicated that he understood his people well. At a certain point, the Minhag America became the most prominent prayer book in North America, so that by the 1870s, virtually all the large congregations in North America used Wise's prayer book, the Minhag America. It is what I would call a moderate reform prayer book. It is reform with no question. If one were to look at the traditional liturgy and then look at his prayer book, it is not by any standard an orthodox prayer book. But its look and its feel and its structure, its look, feel, and structure was very, very traditional. This prayer book came to dominate worship in North America in the 1860s and 70s. Wise understood his constituency and it became a universally popular prayer book. The key point that emerges here is that through this and then a magazine that he wrote, he published it in German and in English. In English, The American Israelite and in German, Die Deborah. By the 1870s, Isaac Mayer Wise was without any question the most prominent rabbi in North America. By far the most prominent rabbi. Wise would go to any city, would go to any city in North America and be recognized immediately and treated with great honor and respect. Hence, by the 1870s, Wise was prepared to launch his attempt to create a rabbinical school. By the way, his haughtiness is really very well captured uh, in a book that deals with the beginnings, for example, any book that would deal with the beginnings of the New York Times. Isaac Merwais was in many ways the father of American or Reform Judaism, not only because he founded the institutions of the Reform movement, but I will tell you he had 14 children. Kainahara, he was uh, prolific in many ways. His youngest daughter, Iphigenia, ended up marrying a man in Chattanooga, Tennessee, who was a newspaper publisher. He had a last name that was spelled O-C-H-S. We have stories told that when Rabbi Wise went to Chattanooga, he regarded his son-in-law, Adolf, with some degree of disdain, he did not think much of newspaper publishers, but his youngest daughter, and I won't get into all the details, she was actually a hellion, and he couldn't wait to get her <laughs> off of his hands, and he married her off immediately, but descriptions from Chattanooga at the time when he went down to do the wedding, he was the king and they treated him accordingly. So his son-in-law did well, his son-in-law ultimately moved to New York, 
and he created a newspaper here called the New York Times. So his son-in-law did succeed. Well, what do they say behind every amazing man who's married? There's an astonished mother-in-law. In this case, in this case, there was an astonished father-in-law. In any event, in 1873, Wise was in a different position. And during that year, he created the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. The UAHC was founded for one purpose and one purpose only. He decided that each congregation would pay a tax. They would pay a tax that would go into the support of a rabbinical college that he would establish in Cincinnati. The UAHC had no other purpose other than for congregations to bind together to create the Hebrew Union College. And in 1875, he realized his dream. He created the Hebrew Union College. Wise contended in 1875 that the Hebrew Union College would ordain Orthodox as well as Reform rabbis. And if you note all the institutions that he created, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the Hebrew Union College, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, and this is my key point for now. The word Jewish does not appear because Jewish was not in quotes as polite a term as Hebrew in the 19th century. But what other term does not appear? If he's the founder of Reform Judaism, what term does not appear? Reform. The irony is that Isaac Merwise, on one level, did not believe he was creating Reform Judaism. When we talk today about classical Reform Judaism, it is not Isaac Merwise's vision of reform that we think of when we talk about classical reform. Wise believed that he was creating American Judaism. And given the cultural homogeneity, the German background, of virtually all the Jews who lived in North America, he nearly succeeded in creating an American Judaism that was not going to be divided denominationally. Isaac Mayer Wise did not believe in a sectarian version of reform. His dream of a union of American Israel began to perish, I would contend, in 1881. Because what began to happen in 1881? Migration of Eastern European Jews, Austudent. Without getting into a great, great description, I will only say that Eastern European Jews were culturally distinct from the German Jews. I'll say a couple more words about that in a moment. Now, Wise had an opponent, the other person in the lecture, David Einhorn. Einhorn was ordained as a rabbi in Germany. In fact, Einhorn was exceptionally learned Judaically. But he was also politically a radical. He had been arrested in the revolutions of 1848, and ultimately he escaped from prison as a great political liberal and came to Baltimore, Maryland. Einhorn was, unlike Wise, who was moderate and could change his views from one time to another, Einhorn was a majority of one. You could have whatever opinion you wanted. David Einhorn, who served as a rabbi here before even going to, uh, or after, I guess, going to Baltimore. No, he came here in 1854, right? Here in New York in 1854 on the congregation that merged with the manual. Einhorn uh, may not, in fact, have always been right, but he was, in fact, never in doubt. He was convinced he was correct. He created a prayer book called the Olat Tamid. The Olat Tamid, there's an irony in this, because Olat Tamid means the eternal offering, the eternal sacrifice, deals with the sacrificial cult. One wouldn't think that a radical reform rabbi would employ that title. He wanted to say that what's the eternal sacrifice, the eternal offering in our day? It's my prayer book. 
Unlike Wise, his prayer book was virtually all in the vernacular. Very little Hebrew in his prayer book. There is some, and I could talk about it, but very little Hebrew. Very little Hebrew in the Olat Tamid. I use the word vernacular, so what language do you think he used? What was the dominant language? German. What language might you have thought he would have used? English. In fact, during his lifetime, he would not even allow the prayer book, his prayer book, to be translated into English. He believed that the pure spirit of Reformed Judaism could only be expressed in pure German. That to use the vernacular, meaning English, it would corrupt, it would corrupt uh, the pure spirit of reform. In 1859, he moved to Baltimore, and there he became an outspoken opponent of slavery. Now, Isaac Mayer Wise, who lived in Cincinnati, and here we talk about the progressive heritage of Reform Judaism, our commitment to social action. Rabbi Wise was asked, what's the position of the Bible in the Jewish religious tradition on slavery? And how do you think he responded? He said, of course slavery is all right. The Bible permits it, and he let it go. Einhorn got up every week in Baltimore and invade against slavery. Finally, in 1860, his board came to him. And I want Rabbi Davidson and Rabbi Posner to hear it. Rabbi Posner doesn't have to worry. He's emeritus. I want Rabbi Davidson to hear this. I must have taught you this in a class, but maybe not. His board came to him and said, Rabbi, you have to stop. You are killing us in this community. Everyone in the newspapers, it's reporting that you're an outspoken opponent of slavery. Our community cannot tolerate this. So in April of 1860, he got up in his pulpit and he reported that the board, in fact, had told him that he was creating this kind of problem and he could not continue to speak in a pro-abolitionist way. He then went on, if I could paraphrase it here, to say, I must not have explained myself well. And he delivered probably one of the most virulent and principled attacks on slavery ever delivered from any American pulpit. Now this I would teach Rabbi Davidson. And this is a quote from my mother. If you stand up for your principles, people will always respect you. They may well respect you, but they will not necessarily then give you a job. That is all I will say. The very next night, they did at least wait till Shabbos was over, he was chased out of Baltimore. And he ended up becoming the rabbi at Knesset Israel in Philadelphia for the remainder of his career. Einhorn detest, detested what he regarded as wise as ersatz reform. If you look at number two, Rabbi Einhorn, before he wrote his prayer book, the Olat Tamid, said this about the Minhag America. May the free American Israel keep a strict watch on hierarchical movements which would again forge its chain. Though under the most charming lullabies of peace, now in the guise of dogmas, and before long, by a minhag America, wise could not have been more detestable than he was to David Einhorn. By 1869, though, Einhorn called a convention of all the rabbis in North America, and these are some of the points in the Philadelphia platform. The messianic goal of Israel is not the restoration of the old Jewish state under a son of David, nor the continued separation from other nations, but the union of all men as children of God, acknowledging God's unity and the oneness of all rational beings. The kahuna, the priests, forget them. The language Hebrew, it's become incomprehensible for the overwhelming majority of our co-religionists. Therefore, in the act of prayer, Hebrew must take second place behind a language which the worshipers can understand. What platform does this sound like, by the way? The Pittsburgh platform. 
Einhorn had two daughters. He couldn't match Isaac Merweiss's 14. One married a man named Kaufman Kohler, who was to write the Pittsburgh platform, who was to write the Pittsburgh platform, and was to become the second president of Hebrew Union College after Isaac Merweiss. I'll talk about Kohler perhaps in a moment. And the other, uh, Levi from uh, Chicago. In fact, Edward Levi, who became the Attorney General of the United States under Richard Nixon, was the great-grandson of David Einhorn. Both of these men, they had children who married quite well and their children did well. The key point that I want to make here is that it was the Judaism of David Einhorn that became what we would call classical reform Judaism. And now I'm going back to 1881. Einhorn and Wise detested one another. One had a very moderate reform, one had a radical reform. The question really is, given that Isaac Mayer Wise created all the institutions of what would become Reform Judaism, why did David Einhorn triumph, and when did it happen, and why? In 1881, the Eastern European Jews came. Wise, I believe, quickly realized that whatever his dream was of a unity of all Jews in North America, Perhaps there'd be radical reformers like Einhorn on the one hand, and people who were genuinely orthodox on the other, but he was going to capture the 80% in the middle, and he virtually did before 1881. By 1883, 200,000 all students had come. There was not a cultural gap between these Eastern European and the German Jews. It was a Grand Canyon. These people had completely different attitudes towards Jewishness, Judaism, the Jewish state. Einhorn came to dominate, and there are three major events that I would talk about in this regard. In 1883, the Hebrew Union College had its first rabbinical class. Benjamin Zold of Baltimore, the father of Henrietta Zold, a positive historical, what we would later call conservative Jew, delivered the graduation, the ordination address. After the address was delivered, there was a banquet. And now I'm going to introduce not a halakhic category, but a sociological one. From the standpoint of halakha, food is either kosher or not kosher. But from a sociological categories, there is what I'm going to call tonight High trafe and low trafe. <laughs> you eat a hamburger that's not prepared in kosher dishes, dishes, the meat hasn't been shechted appropriately, etc. It is not kosher. But from a folk standpoint, low trafe, you eat a hamburger. Had it been prepared appropriately, had the meat been kosher, you could eat beef. High trafe would be the equivalent of going to, I don't know, McDonald's and eating a Big Mac and then saying, let's throw some shrimp on top of it. Woody Allen captures this. You'll remember in some of the movies when an individual desires to convert or when Woody Allen's thinking about it, on the one hand, he begins with the rosary beads, the New Testament, and then he moves to white bread. Uh, or when Diane Keaton, his girlfriend in one of the movies, goes to a deli and says, let me have salami on white bread, cut the crust, and put mayonnaise on it, from a folk standpoint, that's just not a Jewish way to eat salami. I bring this up because in 1883, again, you have one of the most famous or infamous events in American Jewish history. It is known as, in celebration of the first ordination class, the Trefa Banquet. Every bit of non-kosher shellfish that you can imagine was served at this banquet. Now, I have many colleagues, and perhaps Professor Bleich, who's in attendance tonight, could lecture on this. I have many colleagues who tell me that this banquet was a caterer's error, that it was a mistake. I find that hard to believe. With my boss, Sylvia Posner, here, I can tell you what happens at the Hebrew Union College when there's an event. To think that there would be a meal of this magnitude and that this would be a complete mistake 
I'll say nicely, it strains credulity regardless of what anyone tells me in terms of the sources. Furthermore, when all of this trafe was served to people like Benjamin Zold, Wise didn't apologize to anybody. My teacher Stanley Chiat used to say to me, well, he was just haughty and arrogant and wouldn't apologize to anyone. That could be true, but he didn't do anything like the equivalent of, let's get the egg fish and tuna salad out and serve these people. The Trafa banquet delivered the following message to the Eastern European Jews who were in North America. Judaism is not a religion that's going to be determined by what you put in your stomach. Judaism is going to be a universal, rational religion, progressive in or orientation, ever striving to be in accord with the postulates of universal reason. And in 1885, Kaufman Kohler, Einhorn's son-in-law, wrote a platform called the Pittsburgh Platform that says exactly that. It is chewed Zionism, it is chewed ritual observance, it said Judaism is a universal, rational religion. By this point, I would contend that Isaac Mayer Wise's vision of a unified American Judaism had come to an end. He knew that with three, four, five hundred thousand Eastern Europeans, these people weren't going to end up in shul with his people, in his temple. You begin to have what we would begin to call classical reform Judaism, or reform as a separate denomination genuinely begins to emerge during this period. You have to ask, why is a platform written? From a sociological standpoint, a platform serves the function of boundary maintenance and identity formation. It allows you to know where the boundary of acceptable behavior is so you can say who's inside and who's outside. In effect, the German-American Jews of that period, through the writings of Kaufman Kohler, were saying to the Eastern European Jews, either you adapt to our ways or you leave. And it is during this period that the removal of the head covering for males during prayer becomes universally accepted in American reform worship. By and large, it is only in North America where men have ever removed yarmulkes during prayer, only actually in the United States of America. If you go to liberal congregations in other parts of the world, men will always have their head covered. The removal of the yarmulke universally among reformed Jewish males in worship was, I would argue, an instrument of boundary maintenance. When I think of someone like my grandfather, an immigrant from Eastern Europe, to tell someone like my grandfather, you are going to shul and you're going to take, you're going to go bareheaded, it would not have been his shul. And finally, in 1895, a prayer book is adopted, and you can see it right in the back of this sanctuary called the Union Prayer Book. I had an aunt who was originally from Mobile, Alabama, my aunt Bernice. She really was not concerned with the question of whether the Torah came from Sinai, but she had grown up in a classical reform congregation in Mobile. She knew there was one document that came from Sinai. That document was the Union Prayer Book. <laughs> and whenever, whenever she would see me, her first lines from 1975 on were, what have you rabbis done to my union prayer book. It is generally my custom, I will confess, to wear a yarmulke and certainly always during prayer. But when I did do the eulogy at my aunt's funeral, I did remove my yarmulke in respect for her. The union prayer book too served not only as a beautiful exposition of worship, but it also served a boundary maintenance function. By the time you get to the Union Prayer Book for Eastern European Jews to say, enter a temple, remove your talus, remove your yarmulke, pray out of the Union Prayer Book and do not daven, you no longer needed, you no longer needed 
a sign that said, dogs, chimps, and Eastern European Jews stay out. These served as very effective boundary maintenance devices and mechanisms. The key point that emerges from this is that what we call classical reform Judaism in an American setting emerges definitely in the 1880s and 90s in the United States and it is the result not of some great theological debate. It is the result by and large of a cleavage between Jews of Eastern European descent who will go on in the 20th century, and you'll talk about this later, to create conservative Judaism, and Jews of Germanic descent in this country who create a Judaism that we call American reform. The key points that I want you to understand tonight is that both of these men, Rabbi Wise and Rabbi Einhorn, were reformed Jews by any orthodox standards. But Rabbi Wise, Rabbi Wise was the progenitor of a moderate kind of reform, and Rabbi Einhorn the progenitor of what we have come to call classical reform Judaism, of a much more radical, denominationally distinct nature. In terms of the implications, as we go into the 21st century, where the homogeneity of American Judaism is greater than ever before, and later on I'm sure we'll talk about the Pew study in this lecture series, we have moved to a situation much more akin in North American Judaism to the homogeneity that marked the Judaism of Rabbi Wise's day than was true of the 1880s and 1890s, and in large measure what you see in North American Reform Judaism in many congregations today with a greater emphasis on ritual and traditionalism and embrace of the state of Israel represents in a trajectory kind of sense a return to the kind of moderate reform that Isaac Mayer Wise advocated as opposed to a much more pure ideological consistent reform that was the bailiwick of Rabbi Einhorn. There is more to say, there will be more to discuss as this series moves on, but I thank you very much for listening to this tonight. Do we have time for questions? Or? Yeah, I'm happy to take questions, whatever you want to do. Thank you. Rabbi Allenson uh, is uh, gra very graciously willing to take a couple of questions. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to ask you to stand up so that everybody can. Why don't hear. we take three questions good. and then I'll just try to answer good. them That's together. Good. At, okay, at what point did we go from German to English at Emmanuel? I do not know the specificity of that. Do you? David, do you know? I, I'm, I'm not positive exactly when that occurred. My bet would be sometime in the 1880s. Mark Heitlinger, you were here though, right? <laughs> okay, we'll, we can look the answer up. Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah, go ahead. John? I know, it's okay, it's a good joke. Anyway, uh, my question is, um, I wonder why in the 1840s and so forth, they needed so much rabbis. I was born in Egypt, I grew up in congregations where we didn't have rabbis. The first time I saw a rabbi was in Italy when I moved to Italy. And uh, um, the congregation uh, managed through their knowledge and the uh, work and so forth. Okay. So you focus a lot about rabbis, rabbis and, uh, and uh, 
<coughs> in regard to uh, revising. I wonder why that uh, was so pressing. Okay, I'm talking about the importance of rabbis. I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, one, two, and then we'll finish the questions. Right. Okay, talk about the star beam. Okay, last question. Thank you so much for a very fine lecture. I worry, however, that it mythologizes Einhorn a bit much because, of course, the legacy that led to Kohler and to Hirsch was a, a legacy of folks who were scholars of German philosophy yes. who had doctorates from Germany. Yes, universities. absolutely. And, and, and I share your vision about the beauty of the 19th century. Right. Um, the universalist theology of right. these men, some of them rabbis, some of them not, women as well, is something that's a very rich part of our heritage. Right. And so I would say that, you know, just as Kohler, uh, by the 1920s, was very sympathetic to settlements in Palestine or the needs of those affected by the pogroms, I dare say that if we somehow see the beauty of the 1885 Pittsburgh platform as something fixed and rigid, it was just rejecting Zionism and people, but that we miss the beauty of its universalist right. theology. Okay. And I would just say oh. that, you know, you started your lecture mentioning about this element of the um, ways in which perhaps wise is a new theology for a new day. Um, that, you know, I would certainly think that at this dawn of the 21st century that the incredible universalism that we find as we reinvent right. the reform Judaism coming straight out of the Pittsburgh platform right. is Thank you. Okay, let me make a couple of uh, points. I in making this lecture, in offering this lecture tonight, I tried to present in quotes uh, two types of reform. Quite clearly, in contrasting Wise and Einhorn, if this were a, a year-long seminar, it would be done with, I think, a bit more Subtlety, let me just state it this way. There are other details that were overlooked and in attempting to, in one hour, talk about the trajectory of these men, uh, I tried to make it uh, probably as stark as it could possibly be. That you could deliver a lecture in which you would talk about uh, overlaps between them as well. Part of why the issue came up about rabbis is that Wise's whole devotion, his commitment was to the creation of a rabbinical seminary. Can the Jewish people survive without rabbis? Probably they could on one level. On the other hand, you have to ask, what does it mean to talk about issues of authenticity? Presumably, a rabbi should be, among other things, a marbitz Torah. A rabbi should be someone learned in the tradition. And in fact, what one would hope is that uh, people would come to the rabbi uh, for instruction and guidance. Part of why we have rabbis in congregations is that presumably rabbis have expertise in one area where many of their congregants do not, namely the area of Judaism and Jewish knowledge and learning. So that it is not that communities cannot function, I suppose, without such leaders, but the point I think Rabbi Wise would have made is that uh, for the community to reach an optimal, uh, an optimal balance between tradition on the one hand and innovation on the other, rabbis were necessary to provide guidance, wisdom, knowledge, learning. Uh, in light of the Sephardim, it is true that the Sephardic period in American Jewish history and when it dominated was basically during the colonial period. Keep in mind that in 1790, there were at most 9,000 Jews in North America. The period that we refer to as the period of Sephardic domination came during the colonial and early Federalist period. 
First six Jewish communities in the United States, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, because then boats could come up the James River, Philadelphia, New York, and Newport, Rhode Island. They were almost, they were all port cities. And basically Sephardic merchants like Lopez of Newport dominated during that period. The Sephardim set the tonal element of American Jewish life during that period. And you have congregations like that across the park, the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue on 70th and Central Park West, that owes its lineage back to this period in American Jewish history. But quite simply, there were not a lot of Sephardic Jews in this country, and even during this period when you had three to 9,000 Jews, half of them even then came from Germanic backgrounds, though the Sephardim set the tonal element in the community. What began to happen was that they simply were overwhelmed. 9,000 at best, as opposed to 225,000 Jews of Germanic background. That does not mean that there were not congregations that retained their uh, allegiance to Sephardic minhag. But during this period of American Jewish history, it really was a period, by and large, of Germanic Jewish domination. And we could get again into other factors. In light of the last point, I mean, you're obviously quite correct. There is a great deal to learn from the Pittsburgh platform and its commitment to universalism. Men like Hirsch of Chicago and Kohler, who were the sons-in-law of Rabbi Einhorn, were brilliantly educated. I mean, the reality is, and uh, David Posner said it, there's never been a president of the Hebrew Union College who had the Judaic and philosophical knowledge of Kaufman Kohler. It is difficult to exaggerate how learned he was. When the Jewish Encyclopedia was built in 19, or written in 1906, Hirsch and Kohler wrote 40% of it. Louis Ginsburg and others did as well. The reality is that there is a universalism inherent in the Pittsburgh platform that remains crucial for a vibrant and vital reform Judaism today, and the reality is that there are elements of Wise and Einhorn that both remain part of our patrimony and legacy. And I know that with Rabbi Davidson in the weeks ahead and the other lecturers, we'll be able to explore this, and I will look forward to being with you in the spring and telling you all about what the future of reform Judaism will be at that point. Thank you. Rabbi. Let me just say a couple of words before Dr. Ellison goes that it is such a, a, a treat for me to be able to share with my congregation someone who has been so special to me in my growth as a rabbi. And David, I know that you are concluding what has been a, a, a long series of days away from home, and uh, we're so grateful that you were able to come and spend this with us. And as you and, um, and your beloved Rabbi Jackie Ellenson, uh, come now to the end of this stage of your professional journey. Um, we're so grateful to you, and we look forward to the, the guiding leadership that you'll continue to give to all of us. And of course, we look forward to be, your being with us in April. Thank you all for being here tonight.